Hi, I'm Doris Purchase, and welcome to Beyond the Frame, a podcast created just for you by Propeller Art Gallery, artists empowering artists in Toronto. Together, we'll take a deep dive into the hearts and minds of working visual artists today and their practice. In each episode, you will hear illuminating and intimate explorations of all things art, and you'll hear it in the artist's own voice. We'll talk process, inspiration, challenges, and much more. Everything you've ever wanted to know about art making or about the artists themselves happens right here. So let's sit back and have a listen, shall we? Today we welcome Kristen Stephen. Which ism is it? Under which ism would you classify your work? My work would be considered as abstract expressionism. The paintings are color and shape based. I believe in the viewer responding intuitively to my pieces and not having predetermined responses to figures or landscapes. Not to knock landscape artists, but it's just not my thing. I would like the elements of my painting to be idiosyncratic. The paintings fit under the term abstract expressionism because of how spontaneous and intuitive they are. I never go in with a predetermined image in mind. I usually start painting and see where it takes me. I'm not sure if I'm painting from the conscious, unconscious, or both. I just know that my studio is a very magical place. I play with the idea of fauvism as well, this being that color is one of the most important components of my work. Who's your muse? Influencers, educators, mentors, who has greatly inspired you? Well, I think I might break this question up into dead muses and alive muses. The artists that initially informed my practice were Mark Rothko and Helen Frankenthaler. Rothko because of his treatment of color and the large vibrations of color fields. Helen because of the saturation of color on canvas and the looseness and lyrical quality of her application. She used oil paints on unprimed canvas and used turpentine to dilute the oil. I try to achieve this using inks. For a live muses, it would definitely have to be my OCAD U teacher, Nicole Collins. She taught materials and I developed my process in her class. She had us make our own paints, stretchers, and we learned the history of materials. I was able to solidify my process in her class. Another muse is Erin Laurie. I love, love, love her application of paints and the use of colors. I saw her work at a salon style opening and out of all the artists, her work stood out to me the most. Plus, she's super nice. <laughs> materials matter. What are your chosen favorite tools and preferred medium? I work with India inks, inks, acrylics, oils, and glitter on canvas. I usually dye the canvas with India inks, stretch the canvas, and then begin painting. I sometimes will use a clear coating to hold the glitter on. Slump secrets. What methods do you employ to get yourself out of a slump? I should be given an award for procrastination. A slum secret would be telling friends or my boyfriend about upcoming projects so that they can hold me accountable. It's pretty embarrassing when someone asks about a project and I haven't even started. I also love listing. They help with my thoughts and make things more tangible and actually doable. In the beginning. So tell me a bit about your process. Do you have a bag of tricks, lucky talismans, or habits? Where do you start? And more importantly, when do you stop? Ooh, secrets. Hmm. Well, I have a very cozy studio setup. I usually put on a playlist, make some coffee, and get into a headspace where I'm ready to paint. I have a secret way of dyeing the canvas that I can't tell you. <laughs> After dyeing the canvas, I then stretch it. It's very messy. That is usually the hard part. I get covered in ink. I then peek at the canvas and see the arrangements of the composition. I pick the colors and start painting away. I try to leave the painting multiple times and come back to it. There's usually a magic time to stop painting. I have overpainted many times and became obsessive with it. Like, I have to be painting. It's super frustrating when that happens. I am getting better at learning when to step away and learn that I have to leave the painting. Calling all emo. What do you wish people to think or feel when they contemplate your work? I want people to feel a reprieve. I want them to get lost in their thoughts with my paintings. I want to provide softness and comfort through my work. Life can be very hard and demanding. I want a sense of dreaminess to creep in while viewing my work. I also add glitter because it is so seductive. I'm convinced I'm part magpie as well. The struggle is real. 
Talk to me about your biggest challenges as an artist. What methods do you use to overcome these challenges? Oh, where do I start? My biggest challenge is getting my work out in the world. We were never taught at art school how to market your work. The professors just told us that a gallery will magically appear and buy all your work and you will become famous. That's not the case at all. Marketing is such an important component of being an emerging artist. I've learned about social media. I built my own website, SEOs, art show applications. It's endless. Another challenge is obviously COVID. I believe art should be seen in person. I love seeing the textures of paintings and even the sides of paintings. It's hard seeing everything on a flat screen and missing the subtle nuances of color and techniques. Picture perfect. In your opinion, what constitutes a perfect piece of art? And what qualities in your own work would you signify as a perfect work? For example, perfect composition, confident brushstrokes, illustrating a concept, or something else altogether. This is a complicated question. I don't really know what constitutes a perfect piece of art. It's something that I feel makes you have goosebumps. It's a visceral reaction to something. I cried at the moment when I saw one of Picasso's pieces, and I obsessed for years over Motherwell's elegy to the Spanish Republic. They are perfect pieces to me, pure and raw emotional work. Art Speak. How do you feel about titling, discussing, and explaining your work? Titling my pieces usually comes very easily. I usually finish my piece first and then look at it for a very long time. The title usually floats in. I don't really like discussing my work. I'm getting better. I'm doing a podcast, okay? I like my work to stand for itself, which is totally hypocritical of me because I love reading other artist statements and I studied art history at Brock. Tell me what to feel. Just kidding. Heavy metal or classical? What do you listen to while you work? Or is silence your thing? I love listening to hip-hop very loudly. I like the energy of the music. I get into a flow that makes painting fun and exciting. I usually dance, paint, and spill my coffee everywhere. My studio is a messy heaven, by the way. Why for art, though? Why do you make art? I've thought about this question many times. Like, why am I doing this? Or why am I painting in this style? Why am I not a dental hygienist? Just kidding. I feel like I have a spirit inside of me that won't let me rest until I paint. I have to paint. It's in my blood and it is one of the most important things in my life. It defines who I am as a person. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Beyond the Frame, a PAG podcast. To hear more episodes and to view the artist's works, please visit www.propellerartgallery.ca. Hosted by Doris Purchase, Produced by Tracy Thompson and recorded at the Orange Lounge Studio in Toronto. Also, the Propeller Art Gallery recognizes the presence of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, Mississaugas of the Credit, and the Huron Wendat Nations. We acknowledge we are hosted on land governed by Treaty 13, the Toronto Purchase, the Two Row Wampum Treaty, and the Dish with One Spoon Treaty. We are committed to peaceably sharing and caring for the resources around the Great Lakes and operating the gallery on the principles of inclusiveness as we continue to exhibit art created by artists from all over the world. Thank you for listening.